to everyone who is watching this. My name is Christina Bocat and I am a physician here at the Haydick Clinic one day a week. I am not a neurologist. I am trained in anesthesia and did a fellowship in chronic pain. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit today about pain diagnoses that could potentially contribute to headaches and what are some things we can do about that. I was asked first to put in a pitch for our medication overuse treatment strategy trial or MOTS trial. If you have uh, migraines at least 15 days a month and use medication to treat those at least 10 days per month, you might be eligible. Uh, I believe the kind of maximum compensation if you are eligible and enrolled in the trial is uh, $430. So if you are in eligible, uh, you can talk to Heidi at 801-587-8581 or go to www.motstrial.org. So why don't we get started with our main focus today. I think one condition that we often see in the pain world that we is very under-recognized in the headache neurology world is myofascial pain. And basically myofascial pain is pain that comes from the muscles and the connective tissue, not from say a problem with the nerves or bones. Basically what happens is that the muscle fibers became, become disorganized or form these really tight tender bands called trigger points. And when you press on them, they can radiate or spread. So I think a lot of times people don't think it can be muscle if there is that radiation of pain. So what could potentially cause myofascial pain? It can be for several reasons. And I think it's a, something of a chicken and an egg phenomenon. It's possible if you've had injuries, if you've had uh, whiplash, if you've had surgeries, that those muscle fibers can become painful um, and cause headaches. I think also when you tend to have kind of chronic long-standing headaches, you start holding yourself differently, holding your body differently, moving differently, not really wanting to move your head so much. And I think that can potentiate that myofascial pain. Really, tension headaches are basically a form of myofascial pain. So this is basically an example of very characteristic referral patterns. And the one probably most people here are interested in is this one here on the left. The X's represent trigger points, so if you press there, it tends to cause a radiation of pain that tends to go to the back of the head or around the eyebrow there. So you can see that myofascial pain does spread. How do we treat it? Um, it can be a variety of ways. Some people with maybe just milder cases of myofascial pain can you do a home treatment program. This kind of torture looking device is called a Theracane. I believe it's about 30 so dollars you can get it at the Relax the Back store on Amazon. Um, if you're kind of having problems releasing your own trigger points, it may be helpful to see a physical therapist. They may try to teach you a few techniques so you can release those trigger points on your own, or they may even try to do things such as dry needling, which is somewhat similar to acupuncture, or could even um, do trigger point injections under the guidance of a physician. Now one interesting procedure we often do too for migraines is Botox. Now we don't totally know how Botox works. We do understand that the level of the muscle, it's actually interrupting acetylcholine transmission between the nerves. And you need that acetylcholine in order for the muscle fibers to contract. So yes, you are paralyzing the muscles where you put that Botox in. Now is that what's causing the decrease in headaches? Some people think that maybe you are. You're decreasing those trigger points and so you're having fewer headaches. That may be part of it. I will say there's probably another effect that we don't totally understand about Botox. They have done some studies where they'll inject it just subcutaneously into the tissue of a rodent, and they seem to have less pain overall. So yes, there is that aspect where you are treating the trigger points, but I don't think that's the whole picture, and that piece of the puzzle is still unknown. 
Certainly Botox is very effective for migraines. This graph might be a little bit hard to interpret, but it's basically from the major study whereby Botox got its FDA approval for chronic migraine. And what you can see here is showing the dark blue is placebo and the light blue is people that got Botox treatment. And what it's showing is the number of people that had at least a 50% reduction with Botox. So you can see that is statistically significant when you compare it to that placebo group. It is very expensive, so insurance doesn't like to pay for it unless you meet certain criteria. And usually what that is, is you have to have at least 15 headaches a month, eight of which being migraines. They have to last for four days, and they usually like you to have tried at least a couple preventative oral medication trials. It is 31 different injections. This uh, previous slide I showed you are all the different points in the FDA protocol. Usually it only takes about five minutes, so it's pretty quick. Small gauge needle, very similar to an acupuncture needle, and quite few side effects. There can be a little bit of pain in the injection site that should resolve very quickly. Um, you can sometimes get a little bit of a droopy eyelid or some neck pain, but typically that is about it for most people. So another kind of pain topic that frequently we see as a source of headaches is occipital neuralgia, which means your greater occipital nerve is being irritated for some reason. The greater occipital nerve, it's a nerve that comes out between the second and third vertebral body and has contributions from those nerves and then kind of comes out at the base of your skull. So over that bony part you can feel at the back of your head. And it comes up and around towards above the eyebrows there in what we call a ram's horn distribution. So if you can kind of picture a ram's horn, that's kind of the same outline that they think the greater occipital nerve um, sends its distributions as well. Some people can be very tender to the touch if you touch around the base of your skull near that nerve, and that can send intermittent shooting pains up and around. And it's possible that that's the one source of your headache or that that occipital neuralgia can trigger migraines as well. So why does this get irritated? Can be lots of different reasons from prior traumas to what we call degenerative changes or arthritis between that second and third uh, vertebral body. Um, there can also be entrapment of the nerve by muscle as it comes out of the skull and through that muscle layer up the back of the head and sometimes even whiplash injuries. So what can we do about it? Um, we have a lot of options. Some of them are very quick and easy. We can do them right in uh, our typical exam rooms. We can do a nerve block with steroid or without steroid. Usually we will include a little bit of local anesthetic or numbing medication similar to what the dentist may use when they're numbing up your mouth. We can get fancier. We can do ablations that um, use kind of a low heat uh, that we should normally take care of the pain for about six months. We can get even fancier and put in permanent implantable devices like, like occipital nerve stimulators. These seem to work pretty well, but unfortunately insurance doesn't actually cover it, so we rarely can do this at this point in time um, just because it tends to be prohibitively expensive. And there are some surgeons as well that will try to release that nerve or clear up a little room so that there's no connective tissue or muscles kind of impinging or causing more pain on that nerve, actually. Big fat neck and potentially even in between your shoulder blades there. Um, we can also go and do um, um, diagnostic blocks, meaning we just inject a little bit of numbing medication around the nerves that feed those joints and send those pain signals. And if you do respond to that, then we can do an ablation for that too, meaning we can put some needles in that heat up and we basically do destroy that nerve for usually about nine months. Now they do regenerate or grow back, so you can repeat that uh, procedure if needed. There are also several different infusions that we could potentially try. Lidocaine is again a local anesthetic, so it would numb you if you injected it just into the tissue, say around your mouth. What we often do at the pain management center is inject it into a blood vessel so it's circulating throughout your whole body. I will say it 
results in fairly mixed outcomes. Big clinical trials have shown mixed results with how successful it is. And I'd say that's probably similar to what we see. I'd say about 50% of people do respond to this. It is not a cure. We often have to repeat it about every four weeks. Ketamine is another medication that is often used, uh, another medication that is often used uh, as an anesthetic. It's a pain medication. It can also be used to induce general anesthesia, but it's kind of had a resurgence in terms of um, all the different properties we could use it for. It's being looked at more for depression as well. Um, the m little bit of research we have on ketamine use and headaches again is somewhat mixed. It may be effective, but it only seems to be effective for about two weeks. So again, not a cure. Another procedure that's often tried is something called a sphenopalatine block. It's somewhat uncomfortable, although pretty basic when you look at it. We essentially take a very long Q-tip. We soak that Q-tip tip in a local anesthetic and we insert it uh, right back here to the, where we know the sphenopalatine ganglion, which is essentially a collection of nerves live. And we let it sit there for several minutes. It's usually just local anesthetic, so nothing very long acting, but it's thought that for some people, maybe this helps break a bad headache cycle or can help reset whatever kind of overactivity of the nerves is going on there. Um, not great evidence for this, and to be honest, I haven't seen a whole lot of success with this one as well, but um, it, it is still done. I think the one thing that is really important to note is you really want to avoid opioids. Um, we see this a lot in pain management, but usually just makes headaches worse, can easily lead to rebound, as well as addiction and a whole host of other um, potential um, poor outcomes. So that's one I would certainly avoid for headaches. That's about all I have for you guys, so thanks for tuning in.